everyone. Welcome to our presentation on algebraic geometry codes. So first, we're going to be talking about some basics of algebraic geometry to bring you up to speed on the concepts you'll need to know to understand the codes we'll be building. Then we're going to be building a family of codes from plane curves and then moving on to curves on an arbitrary number of variables. And these curves can actually beat the Gilbert Varshamov bound. First, for some background. Let's take a geometric object X and take a subset of points of the object P1 to Pn. Let's take a vector space L of functions on X with values in the finite field FQ, so that F of a point Pi is an FQ for functions F and L. We see that the image of our evaluation map from L to FQ evaluating F at each of the points in the subset is a linear code. This is a very general schema for construction codes and reed solomon codes fall under the schema. Now we're going to talk about what kind of geometric objects we'll be using. Let's take the algebraic closure of the finite field FQ and call it F. We're working over this closure because algebraic geometry only fully works over algebraically closed fields. And we have to make sure that every polynomial has all coefficients in FQ and every point has all components in FQ. When we actually construct a code, we're working in FQ. Let A to the N be an n-dimensional affine space with coordinates x1 to xn in F. Now let I be an ideal of the polynomial ring of n variables on F. Then the algebraic set V of I is the set of zeros on the ideal I. We see that V of I is an affine variety if we can't write it as a disjoint union of algebraic sets V of I1 and V of I2. And V of I is an affine variety exactly when I is a prime ideal. We can perform certain operations in algebraic sets. In particular, algebraic subsets of the affine space are a closed under finite union and arbitrary intersection. They form the closed sets of a topology on the n-dimensional affine space, which is why we think of the affine space as a geometric object. Now let's give an example with the unit circle. Let x be the unit circle in C2, which has equation x squared plus y squared equals one. We take the ideal i generated by the polynomial x squared plus y squared minus one. We take this polynomial because it's where the, uh, the circle is zero. We can write x as equivalent to v of i, so the circle in C2 is an affine variety. Here we see the definition of the coordinate ring and we define the function field of X as the quotient field of the coordinate ring. The dimension of a variety is the transcendence degree of its function field over F. If you know what the transcendence degree is, great. If you don't, you can think of a line as a one dimensional curve in some space. Then we view algebraic curves as one dimensional objects in a function field. We can also define plane curves as curves where N equals two. Projective space is where we take the affine space and include points at infinity that make the space easier to work with. The constructions from now on will really be taking place in projective space. Now we're going to look at some codes that we can define based on plane curves. But first, we're going to look at Bazout's theorem, which will help us bound the dimension and the distance of the upcoming codes. So we know that for a single variable polynomial over FQ, the number of roots of this polynomial is at most the degree of F. And another way of saying this is since the roots of F form the set V of F, the size of the set V of F is at most the degree of F. So now we can generalize this principle to plane curves. And this is what Bazout's theorem does. So let F and G be polynomials defining two plane curves. Uh, if f and g do share a factor, then there can be a lot of common zeros uh, along that factor. But if they don't share a factor, then Bazout's theorem says that the number of common zeros between f and g is at most the product of their degrees. And so once we define this code, we're going to use this to bound k and d. So pick numbers n, l, and m such that n is greater than l, m, and let g be a two variable polynomial over FQ of degree M and make sure it's irreducible in the whole polynomial ring in two variables over F. So again, we're working over F, which is algebraic closure of FQ so that it makes all the algebraic geometry work right. But in order to make this an actual code, we need the coefficients of G to be an FQ. So now using the schema that we talked about before, 
we need to define the geometric space, the points, and the functions. So the geometric space is going to be the algebraic set cut out by G. For the points, we just pick any n rational points in X, where rational points means all of their coordinates are in FQ. And our functions are going to be all polynomials in two variables over FQ that have degree at most L. And now our algebraic geometry code is just uh, the, the image of the evaluation map using three, uh, these three things. So the first thing we have to do is to bound the distance of this code. So suppose that F and G share more than LM zeros. Then by Bazout's theorem, since uh, the degree of F is L and the degree of G is N, that means F and G share a factor. But if F and G share a factor, since G is irreducible, that means that G is a factor of F. But since we know that G of P1 through Pn are all zero, then if G is a factor of F, then F of P1 through Pn are also all zero. So what this means is if F of Pi aren't all zero, then at most L minus M of them are zero. And putting this together, we can get that the distance is at least N minus Lm. So now we've bounded the distance and, now, and we have to look at dimension. So suppose again that f of p1 through pn are all zero. And by Vizut's theorem, this means g is a factor of f as before. So what this means is that f yields a zero code word if and only if you can write f equals gh for some polynomial h. And in this case, we know that the degree of h will be at most l minus m. So for any L, we know that the dimension of the set of polynomials with the degree at most L is going to be L plus two shoes two, if you just write out all possible monic monomials. And from this, we get that the dimension K is at least L plus two choose two minus L minus M plus two choose two. And when you write this out and simplify, it ends up being LM plus one minus M minus one choose two. So let's look at what we have. We have D is at least N minus LM, K is at least LM plus one minus N minus one choose two. And when you add these together, we get K plus D is at least N plus one minus N minus one choose two. So what in the world is this N minus one choose two term we have? And it turns out that this corresponds to the genus G of our curve. Now the genus is a geometric invariant that can be defined in topology and also as a definition in algebraic geometry. And we'll see some more codes later that end up looking like this and using the genus in the same way. So now the big question, do we have an asymptotically good family of codes? Unfortunately, the answer so far is no, because we're only working over plane curves uh, and there are only two variables in our polynomials. There are only Q squared distinct rational points in A2. But since P1 through Pn are all distinct rational points, that means N is at most Q squared. So what this means is in order to get codes with arbitrarily large N, we're going to need a work with polynomials that are defined in more than two variables. So now we're going to be looking at codes on curves um, which have arbitrary number of variables. And this is going to allow us to get uh, better codes with more rational points. So first we need to uh, discuss the topic of a divisor. So a divisor is the linear sum of points of an irreducible smooth projective curve over an algebraically closed field. Um, irreducible and smooth just means that the ideal that you're uh, defining the curve on is the prime ideal. And also that all points have at least one non-zero derivative. So here, this is explicitly the sum that the divisor D will be. And these coefficients um, and P are going to be non-zero for only a finite number of points in the curve. Um, and these points where it is non-zero is called the support of the divisor. And the degree of the divisor is just the sum of the coefficients. There's also the notion of the divisor of a function, uh, which is similarly a sum of a linear sum of the points. And here, the points that the sum is going to be are going to be the zeros or poles of the function. And the coefficients are going to be the multiplicity or order of those zeros and poles. So it's basically a bookkeeping device to keep track of the zeros and poles and their multiplicities and orders. Um, so now we're going to be defining some more things. So recall the coordinate ring um, 
defined in this way, F uh, joined with X, and then also the quotient field um, of the coordinate ring. So we're going to be defining a vector space um, on this divisor D, which is defined to be functions in the non-zero elements of the function field, such that the divisor formed by taking the sum of the divisor of F plus D has all non-negative coefficients. That's what this little squiggly greater or equal to zero means. And then we also put zero in the vector space. Um, and then another definition that we need is the genus that was mentioned earlier. And um, for simplicity, you can view this as the equivalent to a topological genus, which is more easy to understand and is basically the number of holes in a topological space. So here we have an example of different topological surfaces with different genus. Um, formally, the genus is the dimension of this vector space acting on the divisor W, which is called the canonical divisor. And for the purpose of time, we're not going to define right now, but you can just know that the canonical divisor is entirely determined by the curve that it is acting on. So now we are going to define our linear codes. So the linear code C of D and G of length n over fq is the image of a linear map, as always, where here we're going from the vector space we just defined, uh, where g is the divisor we're using, to fq of n, um, defined by evaluation on the set of points p1 through pn, where um, p1 through pn are going to uh, be the points that d is supported on. And in fact, d is going to be just the sum of p1 through pn. And g will be some other divisor with support disjoint from G. So importantly, it's not supported on P1 through Pn. And we're also going to restrict the degree of G in this way. Um, and codes of this form are called geometric Reed-Solomon codes. So the first theorem that we're going to have is that the dimension of these codes is the degree of G minus uh, the genus of the curve G plus one. And the minimum distance D is greater or equal to N minus the degree of G. Now, um, this follows from the riemann rock theorem, um, which again, we're not going to get into, but it's a really important result. And if we add um, the uh, dimension and the minimum distance, we get k plus d is greater or equal to n plus one minus g. And this is actually the exact same results we earlier had with plane curves. So now if we divide by n, um, we have that the rate r plus the relative minimum distance delta is greater or equal to one minus g minus one over n. So now, uh, what we want is to have an asymptotically good family of codes, which means that we need to be able to have an increasing number of points um, that we're finding our codes on. So we need curves with basically as many rational points as we want. So let nq of g be the maximal number of fq rational points on an absolute irreducible non-singular projective curve of g is g. And we're going to uh, let A of Q be the limb soup of NQ of G over G. And now we have this DV bound, which says that A of Q is less than or equal to the square root of Q minus one, which when the quality of Q is square. And the equality is actually the important part, not the upper bound, because it says that if Q is square, then the number of FQ rational points on a curve um, divided by the genus is constant. So if the genus goes to infinity, that means that the number of points that we can work with actually also goes to infinity. So that means that we should be able to create asymptotically good codes. And now we get the main result we want to talk about, which is the TVZ bound. So here, let Q be a square, um, as we said before. And now for every R, there exists an asymptotically good sequence of codes, such as the limit of the information rate is R, and the relative misinstance delta, and we have R plus delta is greater or equal to one minus one over the square root of Q minus one. And it's actually not too hard to see where this, how this follows from the previous um, theorems that we had. So first, remember we had R plus delta is greater or equal to one minus G minus one over N. If we take the limb soup, of both sides. Um, on the right-hand side, this becomes one minus the limb inf, which is what you see here. And then if we move it all downstairs, it becomes the limb soup of n over g. And remember, um, it's n over g instead of g minus one, just because it's the limit. And remember the a of q is defined to be limb soup of n over g. So we can put the equality there. And since q is a square, a over q is equal to the square root of q minus one. So that's where we get this bound. And the good result of this bound 
is that if we recall the Gilbert Varshamov bound um, that we learned about in class with this entropy function on delta, for Q greater or equal to 49, the TVZ bound actually can beat the GV bound for certain values of delta. So here I've plotted both bounds when Q equals 81. Um, I use 81 instead of 49, just so that uh, the difference is a little bit more clear. And so um, the GV bound here is in red and the TVZ bound is in blue. And as you can see for these intermediate values of Delta, the TVZ bound actually is better than the GV bound. So we've built an asymptotically good function of codes um, on these curves that actually beat the GV bound.